our video from yesterday, which is, uh, it was called A Bit About You. And it was about what inspires you, who are your influences, we want to know. And our comments ranged, it was a pretty nice uh, group of comments. Uh, Aaron Brady wrote, for me, it started with Star Wars. Any of us who are old enough to remember seeing the first three in theaters, yeah, that was, it was holy. Best word for it. It became escapism. Yeah, this is, this is great. So if you guys want to go through these at some point and read these comments on the last video and the responses, it was, a, it was a really nice, hopefully more will come in, but this is, yeah. And then Esther Flowers gave a great shout out to her pop. This is his channel and uh, he was her inspiration. I'm going to get to Dusty Grind in one moment because he's the, he's the focus here. And then uh, Ghost Junkie wrote, I was inspired by Shakespeare when I was 12. And that's pretty damn impressive. When I was 12, I was reading like Super Fudge and shit. Well, hey, nothing against Super Fudge or the book that came before it, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, because those books, I mean, I probably still can't write as well as, as she wrote those books. So I, I'm not, I'm just really saying that uh, those books, I, I, I tore through Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, just tore through it. And when I, that same year, I think it was fourth grade, if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't know. And the, I read Rumblefish. That was then, this is now. And then The Outsiders really broke that open for me as a young reader. I was so blown away by that, by that book. And so S.C. E. Hinton really kind of is the one that turned me into a bibliophile. I would get my hands on everything I could read at that point. And even at a young age, they, I didn't like most of what I picked up, but when I found someone prominent, I just, I devoured it, the whole body of work. So then Joy wrote, I thrive on challenge. Prose is the only writing site that offers free and fabulous community inspired challenges that dare. Yeah. So this is cool because this is what we, this is always the aim, right? Give something, some, give somebody something like, like they've never had. So uh, let's see. So this is Dusty Grind. Now, every interaction I've had with Dusty has always been, I hate the word, like, you know, words like, I guess pleasant is a, is a bad way. He's just, it's always been intriguing to me to talk to him via text uh, on, on Discord or wherever, wherever we talk. One day I'll have a real conversation with him, maybe even an interview here on the app, just, you know. Let's see, two word nerds going back and forth. But let's see, this is, um, as a reader, as corny as it sounds, my mother was my biggest influence. Okay, first of all, I like your humility, Dusty, but there's nothing corny about this. This is beautiful. The age of four. So, I mean, if you read together and did voices and sound effects with your mom, yeah, that is, I can't, I mean, it gets no better at that age. So you're lucky. Now, let's see. And he said something interesting here when he said, to this day, I think the absolute worst crime an author can commit is to make their audience see the words on the page. And that was, um, I think a lot, I think only somebody who's read a ton of books or written a lot of books can really deep dive and go, okay, I get that. I mean, you can get what it means on the surface. It's not, it's not like a, you know, a, a, neuroscience metaphor you know what i mean it's not like a but it's at the same time it goes deeper when you when you write a lot and i i know what he means i agree you know i've said before like if i read a sentence i'll say how does it feel how does that feel you know and a lot i think a lot of directors do that a lot of actors and i mean a lot of entertainers or artists or both will do that how does this line feel you know, and well, how do I feel when I see this? You know, reading is just, yeah, it's secondary, it's nature. But I mean, that's a good point he made. And let's see. And he mentioned this guy, uh, this guy, he mentioned uh, as, a word, as a story wordslinger, Stephen King, the modern master of character creation, was my inspiration and my muse. Yeah, so... This is, I'm glad he said that. It's all, I'll tell you a quick story here. Um, 
I was in Los Angeles in 2013. I, I was able to meet one of my favorite directors, a uh, big movie director, blah, blah, blah. But he was, uh, we got to meet, he, he actually, um, he read my first book and he, he threw a blurb on it eventually. But we got to meet and we were talking about writing. And I remember he had read, you know, read me and he said, uh, we were talking about, I don't know how Stephen King came up, but he said his name kind of looked at me, almost kind of worried, right? <laughs> and I don't know where that ever came from. And I and I, the reason I say that is in Portland um, or in other parts of the country, not just Portland, I don't want to start a bunch of squabble, but there were there was a writer I talked to. I did a reading at uh, Powell's. And uh, I remember afterward I went home and then, uh, a writer had asked for my email. This is back when uh, I think it was a Gmail chat thing or it was a Facebook chat, whatever. And I think she had asked me or he had asked me, I think it was, I forget. I, so yeah, your memory goes, it just goes. It, people think that your memory stays, but no, it doesn't. So anyway, this writer was asking me, hey, who are your influences? And I, I just laid him down. I said, well, there's, um, you know, of course, the greats, early Hemingway, like the Green Hills of Africa, um, Dostoevsky, Nabokov, you know, John Fonte, Nelson Algren, Newt Hampson, big one, Bukowski, all the way through the, you know, we were going back and forth. And I mentioned, I read, I read, uh, even when I was a, a teenager, I would read Stephen King. And I mean, I could feel her like sitting aghast at the machine, right? Because you know, Stephen King. So, yeah, you know, and I remember I, I, uh, th there, there was, a a thing with the like small communities of like writers who follow smaller presses or so on and so on and so on to my favorite type of people who don't write, but just read, read, uh, avidly. And so, but when we were talking about, influences i said stephen king and she lost her shit she was oh he can he can you know you know burn in hell and every race letter bookstore thriller and blah 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 and i wanted to say i kept it really cool because one thing i've learned even back then my first book dropped i learned and there's that old like thing you probably see on the back of pickup trucks so you can't fix stupid or whatever those phrases are it's it's you can't argue against insanity and mark twain had a good quote about that what did he say oh by the way another inspiration <clears throat> excuse me was letters from earth by clemens you know mark twain whatever everybody knows that but but it was um about a fallen archangel at the turn of last at the turn of the 1900s who was cast down to earth and he had to write letters to heaven about how just how messed up it was you know how fucked up earth was and his observations were pretty on point if i remember the book correctly i read it a long time ago so point is, is that, um, the point is, is that when I read King, I was, I agree with Dusty here. He, um, he had this book called On Writing. And I think I did, I, yeah, I did. I included that in the comment. When King's On Writing, he mentioned, um, the language of writing. No one talks about that. And what I liked about that was he talked about, I think it was the end of the book when he talked about, or somewhere in the book, he was talking about having breakfast with some writers and, uh, an author he was having breakfast with, she said, no one asks about the language. And I thought that was really interesting because my editor had told me the reason why he wanted to work with people who write like me is because there might not be a plot-driven story, but there's a story in the language. There's a story in the language. And I, 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 have, I stole that line and I have used that on so many other writers that I admire. Like, you know, like uh, my very first, my very first personal YouTube video, I mentioned that there's a story in the language and that was a direct ripoff from my editor. So thanks, Mike. But also the, this comment to me, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going on and on here, but whatever. Uh, if you haven't tuned out yet, this, this is interesting, this last paragraph, because I am also an accredited classical poet, and for that, my style of rhymed and metered poetry and poetry storytelling, I have to blame Poe, and to a lesser extent, well, that's, that's a, 
that's a good lesser extent, Carol. And the cadence and flow of the raven inspired me to not only learn the basics of classical poetry. So, and this is really interesting. And the, you know, the best of which is, you know, the Raven L, right? And uh, I've never said that. I've seen this some, but I've never said it. I've just like Ravenel, Raven. I'm sure it's Ravenel. And um, even down here, White Wolf, she wrote, I would love to learn to write a Ravenel. That sounds awesome. So this is, I love this too, because now we have these two. I don't know. It's just cool to see this. Maybe this will, this will happen. This will happen here with this writer. But so anyway, this is, um, be on the lookout for a video submission. I got that last night. It's about to play where I read one of the best poems I have ever written called Gray Moore Hall. Now, this is a, my favorite part of this whole thing, right? Is this best poems I've ever to say that. Um, and for me to understand what he means by that, you know, you, you, somebody else might, might say something about that, but this to, for him to be that certain that he, uh, he tapped into something. And if you ever hear a writer saying, this is my best work, or this is my best poem, they're typically not being braggadocious or narcissistic or looking for a supply, all these buzzwords, right? They're just, they're just really objectively saying, this is probably my best, probably my best work. I said that once about a book I wrote, and I don't know if it's right or not, but it's how I felt. So anyway, thanks for this, Dusty. I'm going to play this video and close this out. But thank you guys for being here. It's much appreciated. And if you haven't yet already, <laughs> yet already, um, yeah, lack of caffeine makes me redundant. But if you haven't yet already, like and subscribe and go to thepros.com and sign up. It's free to sign up right now. It's free to join. And we have $100 challenges. And we have a really badass community of people that you'll want to meet. So, okay. Uh, you guys have a good rest of your day. This is Thursday, as I just found out by looking at my phone. So, yeah, have a good Thursday. And I will talk to you soon. Take good care. Graymore Hall by Dusty Grine. Dust lies thick in empty hallways as the light begins to fade. Chill wind swirls down ancient chimneys, cold and dry as brittle bone. The old mansion lies uneasy, knowing dues must still be paid. And although there is no movement in its rooms, it's not alone. For the restless souls who died here have been trapped and still remain, and the house once filled with laughter, has grown evil and insane. Now no happiness is found here, only anguish, fear, and pain. In the attic is a nursery, used by little ones no more, where abandoned in one corner sits a broken china doll, while the bowels of the building hold a pit in earthen floor. From this well without a bottom comes the curse of Graymore Hall. In the days before the curse fell, when the house was newly made, standing strong against the weather, its foundation solid stone, there was light and there was laughter, and here children gaily played. Often music could be heard as peaceful moonlight sweetly shone. Every season was spent happy in the sun and snow and rain, but the house once filled with love has now completely gone insane. For its memories of those years, although skewed, are yet retained. It remembers distant yesterdays, bright waves upon a shore, but an evil and dark undertow has clouded its recall. The despair of hope abandoned is a throaty distant roar from the well without a bottom in the heart of Greymore Hall. In those days, beautiful Anna was a sweet and buxom maid but her love for young Paul Graymore meant the seeds of death were sown. For she gave to him her flower, in the basement dirt they laid. There the final drop of virgin blood was spilled with breathy moans. And her sacrifice of innocence into the well did drain. Soon the house was filled with screaming, and the sound drove it insane, as the ductwork rang with echoes and the walls with ichor stain. 
Bittersweet, her loss of purity had opened up a door. In the depths of hell, a demon turned its head toward her blood's call. On its face it wore an evil grin, as if it knew the score. From the well without a bottom, it climbed into Greymore Hall. These young lovers were the first two upon whom the demon preyed, and their ravaged bodies, still alive, into the pit were thrown, ere the monster threw its head back, laughing vile cannonades, and the solid walls around it seemed to buckle and to groan. Darkness gushed forth from the well, like blood from out an open vein, as the house filled up with evil, all its dreams became insane, and the stench of rot and decay simply could not be contained. Through the other living residents, weak flesh, the demon tore. With the ending of their lives, the final barrier did fall. These environs were inhabited by living souls no more. And the well without a bottom held full sway at Greymore Hall. Near a century has passed now since that unholy parade, and the grounds around the building lie weed-choked and overgrown. Faded wallpaper sags peeling, window coverings are frayed, and once lustrous marble fixtures now lie shattered and fly-blown. In the ballroom, jet-black spiders and white maggots darkly rain, while the basement, full of shadows, echoes laughter quite insane, and this sound, which can't be heard, is one that science can't explain. Faintly glowing in the moonlight are green putrid fungus spores which reflect upon the insects who cross ancient remains crawl. Near the blood-red evil light source which shines forth a blighted sore from the well without a bottom far below Old Graymore Hall. It is said the ghosts of Anna and Paul Graymore, though insane, are still haunting rooms and hallways now grown wicked to the core. And the demon they set free that day still lives within the walls. Any humans who set foot inside will find out what's in store, and the well without a bottom will be fed in Greymore Hall. Copyright 2017, Dusty Grind, All Rights Reserved.